Well, good morning, church family. Good to see you this morning. Come on in and find your place with the family today. Are you glad you come today? I said, are you glad you come today? I hope you've come to worship. I hope you've come to worship Jesus today as we focus and fix our hope completely on his glorious return. He's coming on the clouds. Every eye will see him. And the mourning of the world that will take place at that return will give way to the glorious rejoicing of his people. Let's rejoice and stand and sing to him right now. Would you stand with me? Find the song Lion and the Lamb in your handout today. He's coming. Here we go. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. But who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the lamb. The Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is upon Him to preach good news to the poor. Freedom to the prisoners. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to say is here to set the captives free. So who can trust the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? No one. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? The Lord Almighty, who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chain. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Every knee, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow. refused to bow before him, the agent of creation. All who refuse to look upon his creation and see the glory of God, they'll have no choice on that day when he stands on the earth but to bow before him. 
And aren't you happy today because we're renewed, we're new creatures, we have the mind of Christ, we can see the glory and the beauty of God in his creation, we can praise him for it. So let's do that now. You made the starry host, you traced the mountain peaks, you paint the evening sky with wonders. The earth it is your throne, from desert to the sea, all nature testifies your splendor. that we have the opportunity to praise the Lord this morning together. You may be seated. And we have the opportunity to bow the knee even today, but to do so together. And it's so fun to be together as a family of God and to be able to have that privilege to honor him in our hearts and our lives this morning and with our voices. Thank you for joining us this morning. If you happen to be one of our guests, I would just invite you to open up the bulletin. If you received one of those when you came in this morning on the top of the inside left, there's an area that tells you how you can text us and let us know just of your presence today. And that would give us an opportunity to connect with you, and that would be a privilege for us to be able to enjoy. So thank you for allowing us that opportunity. Have you guys enjoyed meeting here in the gymnasium? All right, I have too. I'm getting to see people I don't always get to see, just they don't sit in my neck of the woods. And here, it's all jumbled up, so I love it. I love it so much. I'm going to ask you a big favor and just give you a little bit of direct. Let's do it one more week. Does that sound good? 
Let's do it next week too. And that will give us adequate opportunity just to make those massive improvements that the Lord's allowing us to get done through his grace and through just uh, a lot of uh, special saints uh, down in the auditorium. So let's plan next week to do it one more time right here. And I mean, I had the suggestion, maybe let's just do it every summer. This is great. Not that we need to do a renovation every summer, but the opportunity to be together in this way. It's been a lot of fun. So let's plan that next week as well. Um, I want to draw your attention as well to the bulletin. Same area, just at the bottom section. This is, we're, we're embarking upon the fall. And I know that's hard to stomach and it's hard to grasp, but there's a lot of programs that get started. And there's one, I just don't want to skip over this year or take for granted that you know what it's all about. And as you look in the bottom left of the inside, you'll see some bright colors for our Awana program. Who can tell me what the word Awana means? Say it with me. Approved workers are not ashamed. This is a tool for children's ministry, and it's an equipping tool of the church. We're hoping and praying and investing internal seeds into our children. That's the word of God so that they can know the Bible, they can develop a biblical worldview, and that they can have those nuggets of truth that will be with them for the rest of their lives. So we're investing the Word of God through a scripture memory program and Bible lesson time on Wednesday evening, starting there on August 24th. And we'd love for you to be a part. We'd love for you to uh, encourage your children or your grandchildren to be involved in this program, just so they can be the recipients of a lot of the effort and work of our church. Also, we have some special needs that, uh, that Miss Mandy still has and filling in some of the gaps. And the Lord has provided greatly, but we'd love to have some choice servants come alongside that are willing to make those inter- eternal investments in our children. If you're interested in being a part of that, you can see myself or Miss Mandy as well. And we'd love to get you connected in hearing verses and investing in truth into these kiddos. And speaking of truth, if you wouldn't mind, could you stand with me? And let's go ahead and turn our attention to uh, a, one of our scripture readings for the day. It's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And the scripture says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. If you would please remain standing.
And we will still be singing hallelujah. We will see you face to face. Heaven will adore your name forever. Jesus, Jesus, you will reign. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, you will All God's people said to that, amen. Amen. Remain standing. If you would, take the word of God out. Turn to John chapter 5 for our reading today, additional reading. John chapter 5, verses 24 through 29 is where we're going to read at this time. John 5, 24, Jesus is speaking here. He, He says, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me, has everlasting life, and he shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, for what we have sung about, what we have read about, and what Pastor Rob is getting ready to preach about. And that is the fact that there is life after death. There is eternal life. There is blissful life, uh, Father, in those who know your Son. And Lord, we just thank you for the fact that you're not the God of the dead, but you're the God of the living. Uh, We thank you for, even back as far as uh, the Mosaic uh, times, as Moses wrote about, uh, Lord, you, you are the God of, of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. Uh, these men are alive even today at your feet. And uh, Father, we just thank you so much for these sweet promises. Where would we be without them? Paul wrote about it. Uh, the Apostle Paul said we're all, all of us would be pitied if these are not truths. If these are not real truths, then we above all men should be pitied for believing in it. So God, today, just help us revel in the truth as Pastor Rob comes, give him power in speaking through the Holy Spirit to uh, unveil to us the deep truths that is the resurrection. In it's Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Stuff. 
suffering anguish Despised and rejected Bearing our sins My Redeemer is He And that heal nations Stretched out on a tree Took the nails for me Living He loved me Dying He saved me Buried He carried My sins far away Rising He justified Freely forever One day He's coming Oh glorious day coming, O oh, glorious day, and it might be today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth that we've heard sung this morning. Thank you for the capacity that you have placed within us to glorify you by singing back to you the truth that you have revealed to us. Thank you, Father, that we know for certain, because your word has claimed it to be the case, that you are coming back for us one day. So, Father, I pray that as we study your word this morning, that we would do so with the urgency that the time demands, but also with the comfort that your word brings. And so, guide our time together. May it be to your praise, to the praise of your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We have been studying through our statement of faith. Today is uh, week six of this eight week study. If you have your booklet with you, you can open that up to page four and five. We're going to read two of the statements today. We're going to tackle two of them. And just to remind us of where we've been, uh, statement number one, Pastor Mark DeLong preached through that, and that dealt with bibliology. What do we believe about the Bible? Uh, Chapters or statements two and three, theology proper and Christology, what do we believe about who God is and who Christ is? If you noticed, we skipped number four, which we're going to hit today. We looked at number five. Darren taught us through uh, the 
the theme of pneumatology, the Holy Spirit. And then anthropology, number six, John taught uh, through uh, there, or excuse me, Nate did, and then John led us through a study of soteriology in seven and eight. So today we get to hit four and nine, both of which deal with eschatology or things to come. Things to come. So if you would look in your bulletin or on page four of your uh, booklet, statements number four and nine are found in both spots. So I'd really like for you to follow along as we take a look at some very important doctrines this morning. And here's what number four says. Do you have your eyes on it? Let's read it together. We believe in the personal, premillennial, and imminent return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, for you grammarians who like to outline uh, sentences and uh, identify parts of speech and everything, here's, here's your time right here. If we reduce statement number four to its simplest form, taking out all of the adjectives and descriptors. Maybe you'll want to underline it with me here. Here's what number four says in its simplest form. Let's read it together. We believe in the return of Jesus. We believe in the return of Jesus. Now, to say that we believe in his return implies that we believe that he has already come once. If you're going to return home after the service... We understand that you were there, you came here, and you're going back to where you came from. So to say we believe in the return of Jesus means that we hold that he's already come once. And what was that called? Christmas. And he's coming again. He came the first time, and he's coming again. Take your Bibles, and I appreciate the Mark's reading for us this morning. We're going to turn to a different passage to begin with, though, of Acts chapter 1. The background for today has been laid by what those two guys already read for us. But in Acts chapter 1, we have the, the defense of our position on our belief that he's coming again. Why do we believe this? Why do we hold this to be a core doctrine that we hold to as a church? In Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, the scriptures say this. Now, when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Here's why why we believe that Jesus is coming again. Because the Bible says that Jesus is coming again. He came once and he's coming again. Now, sometimes we need to take a few minutes and just offer a defense on why it matters. Why study it? When you think of eschatology or biblical prophecy or things to come, what comes to your mind? Sometimes it seems too confusing, too overwhelming, too daunting of a task to try to parse everything in Scripture and we may be tempted to just say, well, I've got enough to deal with today. I'll let God take care of what's coming tomorrow when we get there. But here's some reasons why I think it is vitally important for us to study what the Bible has to say about things to come. And they're in your bulletin in the outline here. Number one, a study of things to come reminds us we serve a God with a plan. Let that sink in for just a minute. A study of things to come reminds us, and we are in desperate need of this reminding, that we serve a God with a plan. If things are doomed to go on as they currently are going in our world, in our country, in our society, following the trajectory that they're currently headed, our hope in a God who we claim to be sovereign and almighty and holy will be shaken and sound increasingly nonsensical. If things are going to just keep on going as they're currently going, on the trajectory they're currently going, then when we as Christians stand up and say, we serve a God who is almighty, unchanging, holy, he's he's in control of everything, the world looks around and says, well, pardon me for saying so, but it sure doesn't look like it. See, we have a prophecy in Scripture to remind us and assure us that though things are going in a certain trajectory now, 
It will not always be so. There's a huge difference between God saying, I will be with you through it all, and saying, I know it's coming, and I'll lead you through it. Maybe uh, you've ever experienced this. You go to grandma and grandpa's house or some house, and you're there with your cousins, and there's the door that leads to the basement. And it's a dark basement. You don't go down there very often. But one of your adventurous cousins says, hey, let's go down the basement. It's dark and it smells funny and we don't know it's there. And there's about this much comfort in knowing that what you're about to get yourself into, at least you're going to die with a cousin. That's good. But you don't really know what's coming. So when the cousin says, I will be with you through it all, you're like, some consolation. Thanks a lot. But what if grandpa comes by and says, come here, let's go down the basement. I want to show you something. And he knows there because he's lived there forever and he knows where everything is. And all of a sudden, the fact that somebody knows what's coming is with me brings me a comfort that I don't have otherwise. See, God does not tell us the future that he hopes will come, but one that he has already written, which gives us comfort that he has a plan. Number two, as much as 40% of Scripture was written about events that had not yet taken place at the time of their writing, Some of those prophecies have come to pass, like prophecies concerning Christ, but many still remain. Are you willing to take 40% of your Bible and discount it because it deals with things that were written prophetically? I'm not sure we have that option available to us. If it was so important to God to include it that we know, does it not behoove us to take the time to study it so that we may understand? Number three, a study of things to come keeps us focused and on mission. How many of you are distractible? None of you are distractible. Mark Jervis is distractible. He's the only honest one in here. Is it hard to sometimes keep doing what you're supposed to be doing? I remember uh, as a kid, somebody taught me that when you're mowing a large field, say you go out to the soccer field here and you want to you mow it and you want to get it just right and looking just so, That the way to cut a straight line across a long field is not to look right in front of you, but to pick out an object on the other side of that field and just steer your course straight to what you're looking at. And when you get there, you'll turn around and look and see that you cut a straight line because you had your eyes on what was on the other side of the field. Do you know what we need as believers? We need a book that tells us what's on the other side so that when we plot our course day by day, we're not distracted by the things that are here and there, but we're keeping our eyes, we're fixing our eyes on Jesus so that when we get to the finish line, we'll look back and we'll say, he led me all the way in a straight course. See, studying things to come keeps us focused and on mission. It creates a sense of urgency. It's important that we know this. 1 John 3, 2 says this, that there's coming a day that we're going to see him face to face and let everyone who has this hope in him purify himself, even as he is pure. Staying on mission means that we don't get distracted by the things of the world. We stay the course because we know who holds the future. The last part of just staying on mission is that it gives us hope. You know, evolution never claimed to be able to and does not provide an understanding that everything that we see today will continue to exist indefinitely. Everything in life, in our world, in our universe is moving toward something. Here's where the danger in that lies, and here's a major soapbox, which I promised myself I would not get on, but I'm going to tiptoe on it just for a second. When you see our government spending billions and hundreds of billions of dollars to save the planet, you know that they are doing so without an understanding that there is a God who has already written the end of this planet, and we're not going to mess that up regardless of what we do. I saw a headline this week that said this, total climate meltdown cannot be stopped, says expert. There's coming a day I'm going to meet that expert. And all the other experts who expertly expertise on their expert stuff and are just so dead wrong. Because this world is going toward an end and God has told us what that end is. Should we care for the environment? Absolutely. As stewards, not as owners. God is going to bring to pass that which he has decreed. And we're not going to mess it up. And he's going to wring his hands in heaven and say, I think I need to write Revelation 2.0. 
what have they done? See, we have a God who is in charge, and we don't worry about things that he has already predetermined. So I think we can save our $370 billion energy bill and just read the book and find out what he has determined for us at the end. Number four, why should we study things to come? Because God never intended us not to know his future plans. Can I take you back to the very, very first book in the Bible in Genesis chapter three? Would you turn there with me? Look at Genesis chapter three, and I want to show you this. For those of you who are familiar with the creation account, we've barely gotten into anything in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve are faced with a choice that they get horribly, horribly wrong. Genesis 3, a serpent comes to Eve and deceives her, and she takes a fruit that was forbidden to her, and she eats it. He deceived her, and she ate it. But then what did she do? She shared it with Adam. Adam took the fruit and he ate, not because he was deceived, but because he chose to disobey God's law. And so in verse 6 of Genesis 3, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her And the next three words changed everything. And he ate. Underline those words, or at least make note of it, because there's three words that we're going to study at the end of this uh, message this morning, which are going to be the counterbalance to that. And he ate. In that moment, man, mankind, which consisted of Adam and Eve, fell from the perfect, innocent existence that God created them in. And so as was God's custom, in verses 7 and 8, God came to meet with them and talk with them. But Adam and Eve knew that something was different. They knew that they had done wrong. And so God comes and has a conversation with them that day. And in the very first conversation that God has with a newly fallen man, he sets about to assure that fallen man that he, God, had a plan to fix what man had just broken, even though Adam could not have had any clue the degree to which he had broken it. Look at verse 15 of Genesis chapter 3. This is God talking to the serpent first here in verse 14, and then he continues in verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her, capital S, seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is sometimes referred to as the proto-evangelium, the very first mention of a Savior to come. Satan, you are going to bruise the Holy One on the cross. That's all we give you credit for in his death. But in his death, he will crush your head and he will blow a mortal wound right into your head and you will be destroyed in that moment. This is the first glimpse of the gospel. Understand this. It happened the same day that Adam fell. In the same day that Adam became a sinner, he was given assurance that God had a plan to fix it. That is amazing to me. God never intended us, even as fallen men and women, to live without a knowledge that he has a plan for it all. Let that bring you comfort today. It's woven into our DNA a need to know what's coming Some of you have children who need to know what's coming in the next 20 minutes. What are we doing for lunch? What are we doing after lunch? What's for dinner? What am I doing tomorrow? Goodness, let's, but you know what? We want to know. As adults, we want to know what's coming. Where are we headed? Go on a road trip. Are we there yet? Where are we headed? God determines how much of his future plan we should know. In fact, in Acts chapter 1, just before the verses that we read, The disciples asked, hey, Lord, are you going to at this time restore the kingdom? And he said, it's not for you to know all the days and all the things that God has in store for you. So God keeps his hand on that. Number five, reason to study prophecy, because knowing God's plan brings comfort. The passage in 1 Thessalonians, after it talks about the rapture of the church, Paul says, now, comfort each other with these words. How is a knowledge of what is to come a comfort and not a terror? 
Well, it can be both. But to those who know Jesus Christ, a knowledge of his plan for the future brings us comfort. Now, let's take a look at these words in statement number four that describe this return of Christ. And let's go through them one at a time. We believe in the personal, premillennial, and imminent return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Number one is his personal return. Again, in 1 Thessalonians 4, it says this, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. No uh, delegation of angelic uh, hosts to come. It's interesting, when Jesus was on the cross, he could have called a whole host of angels to come and rescue him. You know what? He could send a whole host of angels to come get us. But as the bridegroom coming for the bride, that is a task he has reserved for himself. I'm doing this myself. The Lord himself, we believe in a personal return of Christ. The gods of man are distant and unknown. The God of the Bible is near and personal. He will come for us himself. Number two, we believe that the return is premillennial. This has to do with our understanding of the timing and order of future events. We believe that he is coming back before, pre, before he initiates his millennial kingdom and reign on the earth. This millennial kingdom was the promised hope of all of Israel. I know we keep referring to some of our Equip You classes, but we did teach through this in uh, Equip You class, Bible Doctrine 2, Session 7 and 8. Encourage you, sbcfamily.org slash EUBD, the number 2, Session 7 and 8, we'll talk through some more of the details of this eschatology if you're interested. The kingdom, though, we believe that Christ is coming back before he sets up the kingdom. The kingdom was a promise given to King David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. God promised David that he would have a kingdom that lasted forever, and one who sat on that throne, the Messiah, was going to be that eternal king. He was going to come in the line of David. This was the expectation of all of Israel when Jesus showed up. Oh, it's the Messiah. It's kingdom time. He must be going to set up the kingdom, which is why when he started talking about going to the cross and dying, it made no sense whatsoever to his followers because it didn't jive with what their Old Testament understanding of the kingdom was going to be. The Messiah doesn't die. The Messiah rules and reigns. How does this work? Scripture also teaches, though, that before this kingdom, this 1,000-year ruling and reigning by Jesus Christ on the throne in Jerusalem, that there will be a time on earth of immense tribulation. The Bible calls it the tribulation. It's the 70th week of Daniel. It's a seven-year time period in which unsaved Israel is judged and the rest of the world with it. Now, our statement of faith does not speak directly to the timing of Christ's return relative to the tribulation, We simply state that it is a pre-millennial return. Keep in mind, keep in mind that his coming has two parts. One is the rapture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in which he comes not to the earth, but to the clouds, and those who are dead in Christ meet him there. We do a, he does a U-turn and takes us back to heaven with him. But at the end of that seven-year tribulation time, the second coming of Christ, where he does step foot back on planet earth, and he comes with his saints And at that time, he initiates the kingdom that he has promised to Israel. We believe that Christ's return is before a literal 1,000-year reign of Christ in that millennial kingdom spoken of in Revelation chapter 20. What's the third word that we use to describe his return? We've got personal, premillennial, and what's the last one? Say it out loud. Imminent. Got to make sure you're with me. Imminent simply means this. There are no biblical prerequisites to Christ's return. There is nothing that has to happen first. This means that we interpret some scriptures like Matthew 24 and 25, this Olivet Discourse of Christ where he says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. We understand that this is a prophecy of his second coming, not his rapture of the church, the imminence of Christ 
is an important aspect of what we understand about things to come. Imminence means this, again. There's nothing that Christ is waiting around in heaven for us to do in order for him to come back. We aren't the ones determining his return. He will choose that time. Now I have a couple questions for you. These are listed in your outline as well. How can I tell if I really live as if the return of Christ is imminent? We may claim to believe that or understand that, but I have this question for us. Do we truly live as if we believe it? Here are three ways in which you can gauge or judge your own life in relationship to the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Number one, I live as if the return of Christ is imminent if I'm interceding fervently in prayer for the lost. This is going to tie in with how we end the message today, talking about the resurrection. The reality that every man, woman, boy, and girl will live forever somewhere. The reality of that fact will drive us to fervent prayer for those who don't know Christ if we believe that he could come today. Because we understand that there isn't time to waste on other secondary matters. Number two, I'm living as if the return of Christ is imminent if I hold loosely to the things of the world and tightly to the things of eternity. Now, we could come up with lots of examples, lots of illustrations. I just have one for us this morning. Because although we would all probably agree, yeah, we should be doing that. We should be loosening our grip on things that are temporary here on earth and tightening our grip on the eternal things that will last forever, those things that Christ has commanded us to. I take you to the story, to the life of Adoniram Judson. His name may be familiar to some of you. He's the first overseas missionary sent out from America, and he traveled to Burma 12 days after marrying his wife. Some honeymoon. 12 days after he married his wife, Anne, They set sail on February 17th, 1812, some 210 years ago. Before Judson proposed marriage to Anne, he wrote a letter to her father, seeking permission to marry her as long as he had full knowledge of what Adoniram Judson felt called to do with his life. Let me read you a portion of the letter. And dads, dads of daughters, listen to this letter And answer for yourself or think for yourself how you might answer a potential suitor to your daughter asking you permission to marry her under these conditions. Here's what he wrote. I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring to see her no more in this world. Whether you can consent to her departure and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of missionary life. Whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you? For the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and for the glory of God. Can you consent to all this in hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory with the crown of righteousness, brightened with the acclamations of praise, which shall redound to her Savior from heathens saved through her means from eternal woe and despair? Her father let her decide, and she said yes. One of the things, moms and dads, we hold most tightly to is our children. Our task ultimately is not to keep them safe, but to ready them for service. Do not hold your children so tightly that they become of no use to God here and now. We sometimes will joke about that helicopter mom, the smother mother, the hover mother, the keep baby safe and secure. Your task is to ready them for battle. To send them out to a world 
that Jesus is coming back to perhaps today to fight the spiritual battle that God has called them to fight, to build them up in their knowledge and the admiration of the Lord so that they may with all boldness fight the fight before he returns. Let them go. Let them serve. Equip them to do what God has called them to do and then boldly with tears send them out. Is that something that only applies 210 years ago? No, because it happened in my office last Friday. Tim and Annette Jones with Maria sat in my office, and Maria is planning by faith to head to Thailand for nine months in about a month's time. Tim shared with me, Tim, I didn't ask you for permission to do this. You're bigger than me. You could probably beat me up. Please don't. But I'd like to share. Tim shared with me, he says, I have a military background. Safety and security is very important to me. It's always utmost on my mind. It's just the grid through which I process life. He said, but God has given me an understanding that my daughter is his and I can send her literally to the other side of the world and it'll be okay. That's how it works. Why? Because Christ could come today. And we must be willing to hold loosely to the things of the world, even if they're the most precious, our children, so that we may grasp tightly to the things of eternity. Number three, how can I tell if I really live as if the return of Christ is imminent? Here's one for us. The prospect of being in heaven tonight excites me thoroughly without a hint of disappointment over what I might miss in this life. If the prospect of missing a TV show tonight once uh, makes you wish that Christ will come tomorrow, friend. You say, that's silly. But tell me what is a legitimate thing that you would rather postpone Christ's return in order that you may experience here on this earth. There isn't anything that compares to what he has prepared for those who love him. C.S. Lewis said this. It's been quoted at our church before. We are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when an infinite joy is offered to us. And like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. Christ has something better, infinitely better. 2 Timothy 4.8, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. You want a crown of righteousness awaiting you? Long for him to come back. Let's take a look in the few moments we have left at the second statement that we're looking at today. Number nine, we believe in the bodily resurrection of the just and the unjust, the everlasting blessedness of the saved and the everlasting conscious punishment of the lost. Let me remind you of what was already read in John 5, 28 and 29. Jesus says, do not marvel For the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave will hear his voice. And they'll come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Three issues for us to consider. Number one, is there really a resurrection of the dead? I mean, really? That sounds kind of fanciful. That sounds like hope so theology for those who just can't believe that this life is all there is. It was a major point of contention in Jesus' day. The Pharisees said, absolutely, there's a resurrection. The Sadducees said, there's no resurrection at all. And these two groups, making up the Sanhedrin, often would bicker with one another on this point in theology. In the early church, it was still going on. The Apostle Paul in Acts 23 stood before the Sanhedrin. He perceived that half were Pharisees, half were Sadducees. So you know what he started talking about? I'm standing before you because of the resurrection of the dead. The Pharisees said, hey, this this guy's okay. The Sadducees said, condemn him. There's no resurrection whatsoever. The next chapter, Acts 24, verse 15, Paul is before Felix the governor. And you know what he claims? He said, Felix, I am before you because of my preaching on the resurrection of the dead. It was still going on in the early church. The fact is, these mortal bodies are corruptible. Here's what that means. You're getting old and breaking down. (laughs) Amen. Amen. It happens. Do you want this body to live forever in the condition it is? No, and it can't. See, Scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, by the way, that's your resurrection chapter. 
1 Corinthians 15 is your resurrection chapter. Go there to learn about the resurrection. But in verse 50, Paul says this, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, the bodies you have right now, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Because the resurrected body is a glorified body like Christ's. In verse 20 of that same chapter, here's what Paul says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The only hope you have to be resurrected is linked to this fact. Jesus was resurrected. He was the first one to be resurrected. Lazarus was resuscitated and he died again. Jesus was resurrected in a glorified body never to die again. Why is that important? Because you and I were made for eternity. But our bodies wear out in one lifetime. This is all we get. So what are we going to do in order to live forever? We're going to need an upgrade. We're going to need a new body capable of one of two possibilities. Living forever in the blessedness of of the presence of Jesus Christ or in the conscious torture and punishment of the lost. Let's take a look at these next two issues. Issue number one, number two, excuse me, the realities of the resurrection to life. See, our statement of faith says we believe in the resurrection of the just and the unjust, that the everlasting blessedness of the saved. And for these two issues, I just want to read scripture to you. So would you go all the way to the end of the book? Revelation 22. And let's finish up at the end of, book of, of uh, Revelation here and read these passages with me. Revelation 22 tells us a little bit of the reality of the resurrection to life, the everlasting blessedness of the saved. Here's what Revelation chapter 22, verses 3 through 5 have to say. And there shall be, what are the next three words? No more curse. Remember those three words you underlined in Genesis 3, 6? And he ate. They are answered in Revelation 22, 3. No more curse. The problem created in Genesis 3, 6 is finally solved in Revelation 22, 3. The curse that came upon everything because he ate is now made new and made right again when there is no curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face. And his name shall be written on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. No more curse. We don't even really have an ability to understand that because everything we plan for things in life to break our cars break our air conditioning breaks and our ovens break this is maybe not a hypothetical this is maybe the reality right now things break we've come to understand that things break imagine an eternity where nothing breaks where you never think a wrong thought but you see him face to face how many of you want to do that for a million years This is the ultimate and the eventual restoration of what Adam broke in Genesis 3, 6. So we, as his followers, have this to look forward to. But the reality is that if the saved enjoy eternal blessedness, that the lost do not. So turn back one page in your Bible to Revelation chapter 20 and look at verses 12 through 15. Revelation 20, 12 through 15. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And the sea gave gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they, these unsaved, were judged, each one according to his works, Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the promise of God. 
he judges sin so severely that he will give the unsaved a new body, one in which is able to endure eternal punishment. The reality is that we believe because Scripture teaches in the resurrection of the just and of the unjust. So the, the question to end with is this. How then ought we live when we take these two realities together that we studied this morning? The imminent return of Christ and the resurrection of the dead. If that doesn't motivate our living, we need to reevaluate how we're living. For those of you here this morning who may not know Christ, you are not a Christian. Understand that that last scripture was speaking of the destiny awaiting you without Christ. You say, wow, what a fear tactic. What a scare tactic. Come to church and get scared out of hell. I would love to scare you out of hell. Fear is a very powerful motivator, but there's one better. There's one better and stronger and more enduring than fear, and it's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will never perish but have everlasting life. To the unbeliever, come to Christ today because he may come back today. And to the believer, live in light of eternity by allowing Christ to live his life through you. Are you living today as if he could come today? And if he came today, would you be okay with that? Or are the things of earth not growing strangely dim because you're not delighting in his face? We believe in the return of Jesus and we believe that he's going to resurrect us when he does. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the truth of your word, the hope that it brings, the comfort but also the challenge. Father, there is so much that we don't know, but you have given us enough to know that you are coming again. I pray, Lord, that if there's one here today, as we sing, that they would come forward in a gymnasium. Lord, it doesn't matter where we are. Eternity is too long to put this off. If your Holy Spirit is convicting one of their sin today and they need to be saved, may they come forward as we sing, that I may explain to them the word of God more thoroughly that they could be saved. The Father, for the one who is a follower of you, who has gotten caught up in the things of earth and the return of Christ is the last thing on their mind, would you reorient our whole thinking so that we may behold the face of Christ today in his word, that we may live for him, that we may please him, that when we get to heaven and look back, we can see that we cut a straight line because we didn't take our eyes off you. We looked unto Jesus who was the author and the finisher of our faith. And so, Father, as your church, allow us to be a church focused on your return today. All we want is you, Lord, more of you today. So live your life through us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and let's look to Jesus. What gift of grace is this Savior, our Redeemer? Let's sing to him now. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Through the deepest valley, he will lead his children. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, his power is display to this i hold my 
by his death, saved by his life. Now we fear not. No faith I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to to this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing, I am free, yet not I. hear him say well done with every breath I long to follow Jesus for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne I hold my hope is only Jesus all the glory ever more to him when the race is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not I but through Christ in me when the race is complete Till my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. And remain standing if you would. Thank you, Pastor Rob, for leading us through a difficult subject, but doing so so skillfully and just giving a great foundation for us to consider the hope that God has given us and a foundation for living out that hope today. So I pray that this word that was spoken will be one that impacts you, that you consider and reconsider as you go throughout your day as well. Join us this evening for home groups. That'll be a great chance to do that, just to rehash and to consider uh, together how that this hope can impact our daily living. Thank you for being here today. If you are our guest, we invite you. There is a welcome table that will be available in the back. We'd love to meet with you, and the leadership would just love that opportunity to get to know you and just con to continue the conversation. A uh, couple words of family news for us all. Um, last week on su Sunday, Bev Sir's brother-in-law, David, went to be with the Lord. So be uh, ministering to the Sir family, and uh, just while I'm considering them also, Give uh, Jeff Sir a big happy birthday today as it's his 77th birthday. So happy for that for him. Also, um, Walt and Ann Shelton celebrated their 63rd wedding anniversary this week on July 26th. So big hand for Walt and Ann as well. <clears throat> While we're clapping, let's move on to Camp Eagle Report. I'm going to share several numbers with you and let's reserve our clapping for the end, but that's all praiseworthy. Uh, this past week was a junior week out at camp, and God did some great work uh, in our midst uh, there and through our church family. One child uh, surrendered to service, has de dedicated his life to serving the Lord, and we're just praising the Lord for that. Another rededicated his life. There were seven other positive spiritual decisions, and then 30 professions of faith. So praise the Lord for his work there at Camp Eagle. 
And as we're kind of wrapping up our Camp Eagle season, just thank you, counselors, for your faithful service, for the great work that you've done. It's been a pleasure just to be a part and to see from afar as well. Thankful for the good work out at camp this, this week, this year. I want to also draw your attention to a couple things going on this week. Our legendary sports outreach will continue on uh, Wednesday night, transitioning sports, but it's been a great time. I have loved doing that and doing it with the church family. And then um, this coming Wednesday night for adults, we'll continue our We Believe series. And uh, Warren King will be leading us. Thank you, Warren, for doing so. And we look forward to that. Um, really, we had a kind of a, a preview of it as we talked about the, the topic of government in the believer's life this coming Wednesday. Also, as you go, just ways to give. You can do so online, by mail, or at the drop boxes that are available on your way out. Thank you for continuing to worship with us. And then one last note, and the intercessor prayer monthly guide is available on the table as you leave as well. Make sure you grab your copy so you can be praying uh, for our world mission staff this, um, this month. So let's bow in prayer as we conclude. Father, thank you for the opportunity just to know you, to have a hope instilled in us through your word, because you are a God with a plan. God, we thank you for that first gospel in which you said that you will be successful in defeating the curse and all the consequences from our choices. God, we thank you for just being a good God who has given us knowledge of your will, has given us the ability to uh, be your child and know that we have life eternal. Father, if there's one here that does not know you, God, we pray that you would continue to work in their hearts even as we go. Father, for those that do, God, would you stir us in such a way that we apply your word and live for you without any reservation today. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You are sent.